Hey folks, welcome to Wreck All The Things. My name's Nathan, and today we're going to be looking at some of the awesome things that we could see anyway in the gameplay trailer for Star Wars Squadrons. <laughs> So right off the bat, it looks like you're going to have to complete the single-player story mode before you can get into the online play. Right here in the beginning of the trailer, it states that your journey begins in a single-player story mode where you're going to learn all of the eight different types of vehicles, four being Imperial, four being Rebellion, that you are going to have to master. Now, I don't normally like games where you kind of play as like both sides, you know, if that makes sense. I just kind of want a bad guy. Let me fight the bad guy, and that's kind of it. This even goes back to uh, Halo 2 days when, you know, you had some missions as Master Chief and some as the Arbiter. Eh, it, it is what it is, but at the same point, I understand you are trying to learn how to use and use well all of the ships. Like I said, four for the Imperial, four for the Rebellion. Well, I guess at this point, it's the the New Republic, so I guess they're New Republic ships, not necessarily Rebellion anymore, but I, dig, I digress. Now, from what I gather, I feel like they're really trying to make this a solid competitive game. Because why else would you have to go through essentially uh, a story mode, which to me it kind of sounds like a really elongated tutorial, just to play the online multiplayer, unless they wanted people to actually know what it was they were doing. Because I don't know about you guys, but I'm one of those guys that usually skips the tutorial and spends the next three hours hating my life. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about here is customization because from the looks of things these aren't even just cosmetic customizations there's some solid gameplay elements involved here now from what they tell you here in the trailer you can fully customize your character what they're wearing what they look like what race even and your ship as well like i'm not gonna lie like this kind of steampunky looking tie bomber <laughs> looks so dope that being said though this game is going to be solely first person so it, sure, it looks great that everybody else can look at how awesome your ship looks. But at the end of the day, you're just looking at the cockpit. That's where they have brought in, obviously, these cockpit customizations, too. Like right here, you can see in the top right that there's a dangly Millennium Falcon there. And obviously, super adorable, the Ewok bobblehead there on your left. Now, who knows how many customizations they're going to have or what they're going to do. Or if any of these cosmetic customizations are actually going to affect gameplay. It would really suck if like that bobblehead was like blocking, like, <laughs> like depending on the ship and the cockpit and whatnot. Uh, it would be really bad if like a bobblehead was like blocking some of your field of view. And it's like, I don't care if I can't see that TIE fighter coming at me. I like my little bobblehead wicket. Now, just a little bit of speculation here. We saw in the launch trailer that there was a couple of frames there where you see Wedge Antilles saving your butt. Now, I'm wondering if that could just be in the campaign, like if he's, say, one of your trainers or something like that, or if potentially something you may end up getting down the line in this game is being able to unlock these certain characters as playable characters in the customization menu. Uh, who knows? But at the end of the day, that was a really awesome Easter egg to see where I'm like, yeah, Wedge Antilles, love you. Or help, maybe you could even actually call in support from another squadron or something and they actually come in and help you out for like a few seconds. Like if that's like, if there's like a perk sort of system, I don't really know at this point. But really at the end of the day, when you kind of see like an Easter egg like that, like a, a huge part of the Star Wars saga being Wedge Antilles just kind of there, it makes you think. Again, is it just campaign that he's just kind of there being a mentor trainer or whatever? Or could he actually make an appearance in the actual multiplayer and again that would probably be as a, a a character customization option or maybe some sort of weird perk that you can call it now we're going to delve into some more technical aspects at least the ones that we see here in this trailer so here we're seeing a tie fighter instrument panel and we've got a lot of stuff to break down so to start things off we have our sensors that is more than likely just going to be a radar and that's pretty self-explanatory hopefully they have some sort of like elevation sort of relative to you kind of deal of where everything's going to be but i'm sure they're going to have that in there next we're going to move up to the components here and that's going to basically show you where all of your chosen loadout essentially is going to be so right there on the left i do believe that is the cluster missiles and then on the right it looks like regular proton torpedoes and it's got the count of what you have left for each item and then right above that we have laser charge so obviously this isn't going to be an ammo based thing 
you're just going to probably be able to only fire in a certain amount of bursts before that thing goes down, and yeah, you're going to have to manage that. That's going to be something that you're going to really want to pay attention to, because the last thing you want to do when you got somebody in your sights after you've been harassing them with fire, and you want to get that last shot off, but you have zero laser charge. I don't like how they call it laser charge. It's blaster charge. Star Wars has blasters. Get out of here. Now moving to the right, we have your ship status indicator. Now this is also pretty self-explanatory. It's going to look like it's going to tell you what your shields are at, what your hull's at, maybe even where in particular you're taking damage. Now that's actually a nifty thought because maybe you might have to really worry about those sorts of things like, oh, like your, your left, you know, upper uh, S-foil in your X-wing is taking a lot of damage uh, and like that's going to be more of a weaker spot. Like is it going to be like more of a weakening thing? Like uh, should you be trying to like get less fire on that? Who knows? Like, this is, again, this is all speculation. So now right here we have the combat display. Now this here is going to be showing you what looks like here anyway, very crucial information about your enemy ships. So right here we obviously have a U-Wing, and here in the bottom left we have what looks like a, a health meter. And just a standard run-of-the-mill health meter. This guy is fully health up at 100. But now on the right there, that number, the 255... I'm wondering if that's like a shield charge or something like that. Like if you have to go through their shields before you hit their health. I don't really know. Uh, it could even just be the amount of firepower they kind of have, whatever. I'm not 100% on that one. But if I had to speculate, I would probably say those two numbers would be the shields of the vehicle as well as the health. Now next we move to power management. Now this looks like it's going to be one of the more crucial aspects to Star Wars Squadrons. So from here I would speculate you would have to juggle between regular sort of ship functions, thrust, and, and engine power, as well as your more tactical blaster components and various other ordnance that you're going to use. I feel like this is going to be one of those things where it's such a simple concept, but it's going to take so long to master. Now, last but not least, we have speed indicator and throttle. Now, this one here seems pretty self-explanatory, but I would assume that in power management, if you are boosting more power to your actual ship systems versus your tactical systems, your speed should probably be able to actually go a whole lot higher. Like the idea of uh, closing your S-foils in your X-wing, I bet that's going to give you a sizable speed boost. That's everything here, for what we see anyway, on the instrument panel. And now we're going to move on to the four different classes of vehicles available to you to play in Star Wars Squadrons. Now the first class we see here is the Fighter class. This is going to be your utility and kind of all-around decent ship. Kind of a jack-of-all-trades, but master of none. And the great thing about this is these ships do not have the same stats. Like, for instance, the X-Wing's got better toughness than the TIE Fighter. I'm sorry, I can't take that one seriously. You couldn't have put durability in? Like, it's like, yeah, well, you know what? My dad's got more toughness than your dad. Sup. But now it looks like the TIE Fighter trumps the X-Wing in speed. And looks like the firepower is pretty well even, which is kind of good. So it looks like they're balancing that by giving the TIE Fighter better speed and probably maneuverability but the X-Wing more, more toughness. Moving on, the next class is the Interceptor class. So in this class, you have your TIE Interceptor as well as your New Republic A-Wing. So from here, you can see it looks like the A-Wing has a very slight toughness advantage. The TIE Interceptor has a slight speed advantage as well as a slight firepower advantage. Now, the Interceptor class is going to be fantastic in dogfighting. Fighter-to-fighter combat is going to be where the Interceptor really shines. Now these ships will also be fantastic at harassing your support ships as well as your bombers. They will be able to get in and get out relatively quick but with lesser firepower. So you are really going to want to watch out for these ships while you're protecting your main objectives. Next up we have the support class. We have the TIE Reaper and the New Republic U-Wing. Now these ships are going to be tougher than your standard snub fighter. They are going to have probably relatively decent speed, but I'm assuming the maneuverability is going to be garbage. But as you can even see here, the firepower is really not that good. So the obvious role for these ships is going to be to support your team. Now that'll be through restocking your troops, that'll be through harassing enemies with things like tractor beams and potentially dropping mines. Now I would assume these ships are probably not going to be as fun to play as during these ship-to-ship -ship melees, but at the same point, ah, uh, you're going to be like the mother hen of your team. You're going to be a very needed part. So, you know, just, your role is important. Just know that. And with the size of these ships, I would assume when it comes to ordnance, they're going to be able to hold a whole lot more than your average snub fighter. Now, last but not least, we have the bomber class. Now, as you can see here, these ships have the highest, 
Uh, toughness stat out of all the other ships. You have the TIE Bomber and the New Republic Y-Wing. Now as you can see here, the Y-Wing looks like it has a slight toughness advantage over the TIE Bomber. The TIE Bomber has a slight speed advantage over the Y-Wing, as well as a slight firepower advantage. These are the ships that you are really going to want on your side when you are attacking those capital ships, and when you are attacking the flagships. But due to their lack of speed and maneuverability, you are really going to need to defend this class of ship. Because with the playstyle of the Interceptor class ship, these guys are going to have a very hard time trying to defend themselves. Now, ships are all fine and dandy, but a ship's only as good as the tech you can throw into it. And that brings us to the components. Now, I'm not going to talk too much here on the components because there's a lot here to go through. If you would like more of a detailed, speculative breakdown, let us know in the comments below. But here it looks like anyway, this top row is mainly just various blaster configurations, be it rapid fire, be it more of a burst, whatever. You also have a multitude of different ordnance options, a couple of different mine options, which will probably be very, very handy during choke points, a couple of different bomb options for your bomber class, even have your own little R2 unit repairing. You got your tractor beam and a couple different kinds of shields, mimic beacon. Mm -hmm. You have different countermeasures here, like your chaff particles, your sensor jammer, squadron mask, more supply options like your supply droid, several shielding options, several hull configurations, as well as several engine options. Now with all these different components, it gives you loads of customization options during your planning phases. Like which bombs may end up working best against different capital ships, different flagships, who knows? Different shielding types, different hull types, how, how they're gonna affect your ship. I'm assuming a thicker hull means it's gonna be less maneuverable. So yeah, there's loads of options here for you to build your fighter exactly the way you want. And now we're going to take a look at the two different modes that they've unveiled here in the gameplay trailer. The first mode just looks like your standard 5v5 dogfighting. Nothing really to go on here, but again, using those components, you are really going to want to customize your ships for just regular dogfights. Whatever's going to give you the upper hand in fighting another snub fighter will obviously be your best choices. And I'm assuming there's going to be varying options that you can choose here within the dogfighting whether it's, you know, just a one and done, or if you're gonna have respawns, uh, how many points, or to a time limit. I'm sure there's gonna be loads of different options within that, but really, I just really wanna move into fleet battles. Now, Star Wars Squadrons is claiming that fleet battles is going to be their signature mode. And from what they say here in the gameplay trailer, looks like each of these battles are gonna be a three-stage battle. One, there's going to be a 5v5 dogfight, which then moves into attacking capital ships, which then will move to attacking your main cruisers. Now, obviously, in the latter two modes, you are going to be having an attacker and a defender, so you're really going to want to have a very well-rounded loadout to be able to pull in the, a long haul on these games. Now, in this game mode, you're really going to want to diversify your squadron. You are going to want a healthy mix of your regular fighters, your interceptors, your bombers, and your supports. And you are going to want to customize your component loadout for the long haul. Because I'm looking at this and I'm thinking that these are going to be some fairly long fleet battles. I'm being reminded of Star Wars Battlefront 2 for the PlayStation 2 and the Galactic Ship Battles. Where you had two different fleets fighting, you, you got to take out the capital ships, you got to take out the, the, the flagships. Ah, oh, it was just so much fun. Now one thing I really doubt you're going to see make a return from Star Wars Battlefronts here into Star Wars Squadrons is being able to get out of your ship. In Star Wars Battlefront 2, you actually had the option to fly your ship, potentially even uh, a troop transport, into the enemy hangar. You could harass enemies on respawn, constantly trying to blow up their ships before they leave, but every component that was on the outside of the ships that you could destroy, you could destroy from the inside. You could blow up their shield generators, you could mess with their engines, you could mess with their auto turrets, as well as just blow up their bridge. Now, even though you can customize the look of your character, I don't think they're going to be bringing that into this game. Even though, to me, the idea of kind of customizing your character kind of doesn't mean a whole lot if other players can't see your character, especially in a first-person game where you yourself can't see your character, except in maybe, like, loading screens and stuff like that. To me, that's just a weird thing. It's like a, such a non-needed element if nobody else is going to see your character. But to be honest, I really do think this is just going to be another level of customization. Whether it's needed or not, I don't think you're gonna be able to land in the enemy hangar and disrupt their ship. Even though that would be so awesome, I, I, I don't think they're gonna add it. Now they say here that you are going to get to meet your team in the social hub where you can coordinate your strategy, 
you can coordinate your loadouts and stuff. So it makes me wonder how much time you're going to have before you actually enter a game. Now, I'd assume because of the fact that you can also play this versus AI, like that would be almost like an indefinite amount of time before you could start a game if you wanted to. But there's got to be some sort of timer to keep the game going. Or you might have like a minute or two in order to really coordinate this stuff. I really don't see it going too crazy long in the actual PvP. The only thing that I'm having a hard time speculating on is what's going to happen during fleet battles in a win-loss kind of scenario. Now, by that I mean if you win the dogfight but you lose the attack on the capital ships, does that mean you go back to the dogfight and then you end up going toward your capital ships afterward if you lose that dogfight? Is it just going to be that kind of back and forth? Or does that just mean you lose? My best guess is that if you win the dogfight but then you lose your attack on the enemy capital ships, that's probably going to be where it ends. Now, to me, I would assume that these games anyway could last anywhere between, say, 10 minutes and potentially even a half hour if you go all the way and take out the actual flagships. The last thing I'm going to speculate on is I don't think you're going to be limited to just one ship, especially in these fleet battles where there are going to be multi-stage engagements. If you're looking at bombing capital ships in the second stage, you really don't want to be bringing a bomber to a dogfight. You're going to be heavily outclassed. So it makes me wonder if you're going to be able to have several ship builds in the customization options for each stage of the fleet battle. Because if you end up being on the defending side, like being it defending your capital ships or defending your flagships, you're not going to want to bring any bombers. You're only going to want your interceptor classes and your fighter classes, plus obviously maybe a support or two. So that's it. That is my in-depth look here at Star Wars Squadron's gameplay trailer. Obviously there's going to be going to be more stuff released because come on we've got like what four months five months until this game is dropped so i'm assuming we're going to get a whole lot more information but that's it for me you've been watching wreck all the things my name is nathan keeping everything awesome everything nerdy and peace